So the other side of like the renewable green tech thing from EV is renewable energy. Whether it's solar, wind, hydroelectric, any other variety of other kind of niche energy generation sources, these are meant to be partnered with EVs to make their carbon offset kind of less of a problem. So what do we actually like investigate into renewables? Like what downsides exist? I mean, it's infinite renewable energy. You know, you don't necessarily have too many concerns. However, it's once again not represented the way that it is practically applied. So once again, credit's kind of the exact same because this was originally one large video, but it was kind of going to be way too long. So uh, be sure to check these sources out. Pause if you, you need a little bit more time to read them. And as far as what I'm covering today, we'll of course be taking a look at wind power, solar power, hydro, material science, nuclear is kind of a alternative option, and then my personal thoughts. Uh, we'll move into some more energy topics in the next couple of videos, but this is probably the second longest one by comparison. So a little bit of a recap from last episode as far as approaches to EVs and energy generation is kind of a individualized thing. It's like a whole unit. So California is, of course, pushing their whole new car EV sales by 2035 are all, it's all EV. There's no internal combustion engines. So this is the big push, right? The eventual other shoe will drop for EVs when people start to figure out, oh, even if I am paying my electricity provider to get renewables, if they're readily available, I'm not necessarily getting that. And most people are going to end up kind of seeing that at a certain point. But if we look at California in particular, their energy generation model, you do get to see hydro is there. You get to see other renewables are there, but if you stack those, those are still not even the same level that motor gasoline is, much less natural gas. So there needs to be significant investment. The problem is hydroelectric, outside of maybe gaining some efficiency, is not necessarily a big expandable option in the future. You can't necessarily, we'll, we'll take a look at it more in a moment. Um, and then other renewables, of course, your solar, your wind power, all the other, you know, coastal type things as well. Um, either building more of them or making them are more efficient. The problem within California in particular is spacing, right? Not only is spacing a thing because you are like one of the largest, I think it's the third largest state by area. You have transmission issues as far as getting the energy from where it's generated to your population centers because you can't necessarily build most of these in your big population centers. And you're one of the most populous states in the, in the, the country. So your demands are going to be much higher than most places, which is why they import a lot of natural gas. Now, of course, this is 2020. It's a couple of years old, but still a good barometer. Anyway... Let's look at the Germans, because they're another one of these big bastions of green energy. And, well, this is what we're getting in terms of wind power. The, the chart there on the right and their overall energy mix. You do have a couple of places where wind energy is great, because it's part of the northern European plain. It's flat. Wind goes across it great. The problem is you have a few areas that are ideal, some moderate, but you're the only country in Europe aside from maybe Poland and some portions of France that this is a viable option for. And as we've seen, well, there's been a lot of efforts within, say, like the last decade plus to expand the German green infrastructure. Their current, well, by 2021 standards, so pre-Russian invasion, by the way, in terms of their overall mix of energy Natural gas took a spike and is largely being supplemented by Norway at this point. Nuclear is going down because they're shutting those down for the most part, all the reactors. I think they may have extended one or maybe two of them. 
but that you know they're kind of getting towards that point. Wind and solar has kind of made a a little bit of a spike, but also so is biofuel, and you have just regular oil. So even with them being one of the best set up countries in Europe for wind in particular, they have enough of a populace to where unless you really are covering that country in windmills, is probably not going to be capable of providing you the energy. Now, maybe in the future with different material science advancements and efficiency advancements, that changes. But currently, the idea that the Germans or the Californians are able to fully green their grid by like even 2050 is probably a little bit of a pipe dream. And, you know, outside, of, that, of course, the UK is really ideal for, uh, for wind. Um, but once again, most of what you're looking at in Europe for solar is going to be a little bit worse than what you're looking at in this map. So Germany... California, the two big bastions there, limited in their capability as far as renewables are concerned. So let's take a look at materials, because this was one of the big things for EVs. EVs require a lot more in terms of materials that go into them. Most of the materials we don't indigenously produce or refine. Windmills, a little bit of the same. So a lot of copper goes into windmills. I do believe to an extent uh, we produce some, yeah, we produce 6% of the global copper, but most of it comes from Chile, Peru, China, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, with the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Koreans importing them the most. Uh, yeah. It's one of those things, copper is probably going to be one of the kind of overlooked materials that's required in this not necessarily because it's super rare but it's used in so many things so you have a lot of offshore generation and onshore generation now for the u.s offshore is less of a large market because you know we, we do have a large coastline but at the same time most of our population centers are well, I say a lot of our population centers are on the coast, but we have a lot of large population centers inland. So once again, transmission is going to be a bit of a problem here. But you also require a lot of zinc. Now, zinc largely produced in China, Peru, and Australia with the Chinese, the Koreans, the Belgians, and the Canadians importing most of it. This, these two are the big ones. There's, of course, a, a lot of other things that go into it. Uh, nickel, manganese, um, chromium goes in there. A little bit of the molly debunum that I definitely know I didn't pronounce right last time or this time. Uh, but regardless, copper and zinc are your big two. Now, copper we're not as hurting on. You know, that's something we can kind of do internally. Copper is also one of those metals, from my understanding, that is pretty much infinitely recyclable, uh, much to an extent like steel. Zinc's also kind of the same way. So there is kind of some future longevity there, but this is something we're still importing a good portion of what makes up these. And once again, the extracting and refining of these are not necessarily super green either. Uh, so your windmills are starting at an offset. Now, they actually generate power, so they kind of you know pay for themselves fairly quickly. But once again, something we need to consider when we're looking at expanding our wind farms is that we will require more materials than our kind of normal production, uh, energy production capabilities. Now, if we look at kind of the extended map of what we looked at for the Germans earlier for wind power, geographically speaking, you see that there's a lot of just not great places for wind. Uh, usually either a plains or a coastline. So as you see there in the middle of the United States, ideal. Um, and then up around Alaska. The plains, whether it's the central plains in the U.S., the northern, uh, the Norman, nor northern European plain, or like the nor northern Chinese plain, uh, you have options. You have some good areas. 
part of the problems that start to come in, and this is kind of the inverse of what we looked at with offshore, which is you know why you don't see a lot of red necessarily out there on the coasts of the U.S. Um, transmission is one of the biggest problems that you're looking at for renewables. They can generate electricity, maybe not necessarily enough to cover you know, the populace of the country. But if you're producing it all in the middle of the country, by the time you get it to the uh, seaboards, you're, you've lost enough that you start to have diminishing returns on the transmission, and you're starting to look at diminishing returns on land usage once you start to get outside of that ideal range. Um, now, there are some things that kind of go in the favor of wind power here, uh, you know, efficiency is something that they're already working on. The taller you can make a windmill, um, to an extent, there are different air currents you can get access to, and those can generate more power more consistently. Um, but once again, even if you're building them all in kind of the central plane, which is going to be your best bet in terms of consistent, regular, high output, you're going to start having issues once you're trying to get it out of that area. Now, I will say, being in Texas, uh, if you are unfamiliar with who ERCOT is, they are the kind of government body here in Texas that oversees our, maybe it's actually an industry body. Regardless, they run our power generation. Like, they're the kind of overseeing body there. Um, and with the whole heat bubble, <laughs> the the triple digit heat that we've had for like the last two months, maybe more, they have fairly regularly over this time issued conservation warnings. A good portion of that, not entirely obviously, there are other contributing factors, a lot of usage obviously. There are decreases in the overall output that solar and wind have been putting in. Now, you're probably thinking, well, solar, why, why is that a problem? It's, it's super hot there. Yes, and it has been very sunny. But it has not been as windy as normal. So while solar may go up a little bit, it is not enough to compensate for the lack of wind we've had. A uh, little bit of a problem there, but just some kind of anecdotal uh, stories that kind of go along with this, that if you're looking at dips in either sunshine or wind is kind of, you know, it, it's more typically blown out of proportion in these arguments, but it's not consistent. You cannot count on the wind to blow. You cannot count on the sun to shine. Now, you can generally, through meteorology, kind of get a good idea, but it's not something that's constantly running. And when you're looking at power, it's pretty important, especially if it's in extreme weather situations where it's been in the triple digits for a few months or it's well below what we're used to in terms of temperature, like snowstorms, ice storms, freezings, and whatnot. So what about solar? Solar is the other part of this, obviously. Copper and silicone, both of which are recyclable. Uh, silicone's a little different from my understanding. There are different kind of grades of it, I think. Um, and I could be misunderstanding what I was reading, but uh, it is recyclable up to a point, and it... it it's still usable, it's just not to the same necessary uh, stability. Regardless, uh, copper is kind of the same situation here, and silicone is obviously not going to be on this list because it's not. Oh, it is on this list. I don't know what I'm thinking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> silicone largely coming from China, Russia, and Brazil, so you can kind of cut that 7% of Russia out. Um, and then China's a whole, a whole other story. Brazil, also kind of another story in and of itself. But China, Japan, Taiwan, and Korea import the vast majority of it. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, similar situation here. We do produce some copper indigenously, so that's not as big of a problem. Silicone we're going to have to get from somebody. Most of the places that produce it are not overly friendly to us. So, and not to say we don't have trade relations with China or Brazil, but this could be one of those things that's used strategically against us if necessary. Um, now, once again, even with the kind of disparity here where it's really two big things, it's just copper and silicon, you don't see really anything else there. Um, there are, I wouldn't say recyclable concerns, but longevity concerns with these that we'll look at in a moment. But as far as geography is concerned, 
you see a little bit more of a kind of good thing, depending on where you are. So as far as like the Western United States, kind of central to the West and down into Mexico, you have some really good areas in terms of solar generation. Once again, transmission, depending on where you are, is a little bit of a problem, but regardless, you have that option. Uh, you do have a good swath of it through the rest of the U.S. for the most part uh, that could do some moderate generation. You down, look down into South America, you have some decent areas. You'll notice the vast majority of Europe is not really going to be able to use this. Europeans, while they do get sunshine, is uh, not enough in terms of consistency to generate a lot of electricity for the large populous centers that you have um, to really rely on it as a sole means or even a large portion of your energy mix. Now you have a good set of areas in Africa, the Middle East, China, and <laughs> a lot of Australia. Um, but once again, transmission is going to start to be your issue. Uh, and as far as geography as well is concerned, even if you see red in areas, that doesn't necessarily mean you can use every area in there, right? Uh, mis middle of deserts are very inhospitable. Um, and while you can just leave solar panels up, the further out they are, the worse transmission is going to get. You're going to have bleed off, depending on how far you're going. And if you're looking at mountainous regions or jungle regions or heavy forested regions... You're looking at the difficulty of building as well as maybe not even being able to build there. Now, this is really kind of the big concern for Europe. They do have some decent wind generation capability, but without, say, you know, even Italy to an extent, which is low, or southern Spain, getting energy from those areas to northern Europe is not really going to work either, which is why they have such a reliance on natural gas. Now... Hydro is a little different. Now, I'm, I'm really only looking at the U.S. for this because hydro is one of those things that doesn't get talked about a lot because it's a little bit of the almost the breaking point between, I would say, your more like renewable energy people and your environmentalists. Largely because dams kind of do more environmental damage depending on where they are than good. Um, now, I'm not going to come out and say that energy generation is not important, that some dams are necessary, um, and that you know, river control is a beneficial thing for developing um, civilization to an extent. But we also have to understand that even looking here, there are not a lot of places that are really going to be able to be utilized, right? We're, we're not necessarily at the peak of our use in terms of building hydroelectric. However, even with our really extensive waterway system, we're really not in the area of building more of these. We've gotten to the point where we start to see that well, dams are maybe a little bit longer term of an investment, and you know they're going to be around for a while. I mean, Hoover Dam's still around, and it's, it's I think it's coming up close to its hundredth, if not slightly over at this point. Um, you know, you have to have the river. You have to also consider how this is going to impact uh, water usage, um, and with everything that's kind of going on in the Colorado River Basin and their water distribution between the states and Mexico you start to have concerns as far as water usage, water using, you know, water, how do I want to say this? Water not being bogarted by certain areas. Uh, I'm looking at you, California. But regardless, outside of making these more efficient, you're really not looking at much more than what we have now. We're not looking at building a lot of new dam projects, especially in terms of hydroelectric. And we're really not looking at a lot of advancements in terms of making hydro one of the big ones. Now, in terms of iron environmental concerns, and this is something that I don't think gets a lot of talk, uh, very reasonably so, because unless you're in these areas, it doesn't directly affect you and 
you know, it's one of those difficult conversations to have. Dams have a few problems just off the bat. And this is something that humanity as a whole has been dealing with for a long time. Whenever you build a dam, what you're effectively allowing to happen is all of the silt that the river carries gets stopped by the dam and the water flows over. So eventually you do get a buildup of silt and it changes how the river flows downriver. It's faster. There's not silt. It's, it doesn't have anything slowing it down. It's going faster once it gets out of the dam. Now, there are things you can kind of do to slow that process, but inevitably, once it comes out without that silt, you have issues, right? There are a lot of diagrams and you know, videos you can kind of look at to get the idea of how this works. But part of that is it changes the composition of the soil around rivers and the riverbed as well. It also affects wildlife in that area. So you have issues in terms of how rivers flow their impacts downriver, and especially if you have a river that has multiple dams in it um once you start to get downriver, it has more exponentially increasing effects on those areas um and then you start to have inconsistencies like right? as much as dams and sluice gates floodgates whatever are designed to help us control rivers. To an extent, they contribute slightly more to floods and droughts. Now, largely, this is not where the dams are. This is much further downriver. But even with our ability to change landscapes, it doesn't really... These changes we make are not really long-term changes. We don't really think super far ahead, which is... You know, not to discredit anyone in these industries or these fields, but you don't, you, we're really trying to make nature work for us, and eventually that stops working. Now, uh, this is something, like I said, hydro, it does generate a lot of power, but not by comparison of how many people we, we have in our energy needs. Um, and it has more environmental impacts I'd say directly than what you're looking at with solar or windmills even with how much space they take up so hydro interesting one doesn't really have a lot of I would say future it's kind of one of those things that's built in and yeah sure you can make turbines a little bit more efficient here and there but you're really probably not revolutionizing this form of energy. And yeah, it's, it's a difficult conversation to have, but I think it's an important one when we're looking at renewables. So what, should, what hill are we really looking to die on? What, what do we need to focus on as people? Like, what should we turn our attention to? Uh, so first things first, if we're looking at going for renewables we need to be able to combat the consistency problem. Batteries are pretty much the only way. We need to be able to store the excess energy we generate on good days so we can use it on bad days. Part of the problem is we don't have the capacity to do that, right? We do have batteries, like these Tesla batteries can be installed in homes, and they're, of course, larger industrial batteries. The problem is they don't hold days of energy. They hold hours. So we need to look at different ways of storing that energy, making our batteries more efficient. Um, and there's, you know, some options out there as far as possibilities, but we don't really have anything right now that in the near future looks to be like mass producible um, that solves this problem. Because even if you have rows and rows and rows of these batteries, which we've already looked, because these are effectively similar compositions to EV batteries, these do not have, like, have the situation where they will hold that charge for days and days and days, even if you have a lot of them. So even if you, if, even if you have more than you could even use to store access energy, much like a phone battery, much like an EV battery, they will degrade over time, and these are not really designed to hold charge for days to weeks at a time. Then you also have the issue of transmission. So if you're not generating your energy locally, it's coming from somewhere. 
and this is kind of to slowly tie down into the LK-99 situation, um, we are at a lot of... The further you're transporting electricity, even on high-voltage wires, you have loss. And by a certain point, you have effectively used as much energy to transmit that energy to that point that the energy was there. So basically, you've <laughs> used enough to basically negate the entire process. Now... That is because, for the most part, we can't use superconductors. Most of your superconductors require certain environmental requirements that we can't guarantee in wires. LK99 being like a room temperature one, this was a viable option potentially, but it's not. Even if they were able to recreate this particular material um, in the experiments they've done over and over and over, we're still years, maybe decades, away from mass production. So, while that's maybe a viability, it's not something short-term that's likely, and we don't even know if that's an option long-term at this point. So, transmission's another issue. If you're not generating energy locally, a bit of a problem, which is why, typically, you don't have a lot of energy generation sources in the middle of nowhere. As long as they're relatively close, let's say a few hundred miles, of a population center. Okay, great. But otherwise, a bit of a problem. And then you have to look at materials for solar panels. One of the issues that you have is longevity and efficiency. So generally, and of course it depends on a variety of factors, solar panels are generally gauged to last like 10 to 15 years before they need any kind of maintenance or replacement. Um, once again, Variety of factors can contribute to longer or shorter periods of time, but generally I think that's the average I've seen. That is a bit of a problem. Now, these are recyclable, sure, but once again, unless your grid is green, the process to recycle, refurbish, and reuse these isn't going to... It's, once again, putting that offset. Now... I get that this is all designed to be a long-term conversation that we will eventually, ideally, green the grid. But if you've taken anything from these videos, it really should be that we don't necessarily have the full capability as our population continues to grow to an extent to utilize that. We don't have the energy generation capability to match our population in terms of green energy. So we will need some supplements. Batteries are an option. More efficient transmission cables are an option where you can have those wind farms in the absolute middle of nowhere and can be hundreds if not thousands of miles from major population centers, which we can't really do now effectively. So what do we need in the, in the midterm, the interim? Uh, one of the hills I think we should die on, one of the conversations we should be having is... Nuclear, but not in the way that we currently do it. So, uh, you know, nuclear takes a while to build, very understandably. Um, and something that a lot of people have talked about and kind of see as maybe a pipe dream to an extent is thorium. There are other radioactive materials out there that are not plutonium or uranium. Now, of course, plutonium is your most common uh, nuclear energy source, your most usual fuel. Thorium is an option. We have not explored it extensively, largely because when we started exploring nuclear energy uh, slightly prior to World War II, we came to the understanding that thorium, for the most part, could not be weaponized, uh, at least to the same extent that plutonium and uranium could be. So we're like, okay, well, whatever. Shut up, thorium. We're getting out of here. And we haven't really touched it since. Like, there have been a couple of experiments here and there, but nothing to a large degree. Um, and then it's kind of come back into the common, the conversation in like last decade. Uh, but generally, thorium on its own, it's much more plentiful than that of uranium plutonium. It's naturally not radioactive, but can be made to be so. And its um, emissions, if you will, the, the product, the byproduct, the afterproduct of the fuel rod being spent is not only less radioactive than that of what we currently have, but also has a much shorter half-life. Now, you still have storage concerns, sure, understandable, 
but not to the same degree we have now. So if we could look at this, this is something that we could use to supplement our green energy framework if it is not uh, up to snuff. So if we don't have those leaps of material science for batteries or transmission cables, then this is an option that you could build pretty much anywhere with a material that is much more readily available and would be a little bit closer in terms of what the kind of the original bill of sale was for nuclear where sure you know energy is not going to be free but it will be to an extent cheaper depending on what you're looking at um and you know longevity of course is something that is something we have to look at with green energy it's more readily available it is less of an intensive process in terms of extraction and processing to an extent. Um, and it can produce energy for much longer spans of time. So something to consider. Once again, it's not exactly uh, something we can build right now. It's something that needs to be researched. And even so, building these types of facilities is not a quick process either. So it's just something to consider. So my personal thoughts. Once again, green isn't a bad option. It's just not the only option, and it's most likely not going to be the only option. Not bad, not great. So it definitely needs to be a part of our energy mix, but is not the sole part of our energy mix. Once again, energy policy can be politicized. It often is, but energy generation shouldn't be. Our approach to how we regulate, how we supervise energy producers, different question, but the ability to generate electricity either via solar, windmill, um, nuclear to an extent, is something we should kind of just build into our kind of general consciousness, right? We, we need to understand that... Our energy needs are not going down anytime soon. If anything, they're going to continue to grow at large rates. So we need an energy grid that can keep up with that, especially if we have stupid heat bubbles that keep the heat so hot so consistently. Dear God, if we had another triple-digit day, which we 100% will, it's, it's August in Texas, y'all. We, we have triple digits into November at this point. This, this sucks. I'm not happy about it. Um, but yeah, so energy generation is important. We should look at a lot of options and understand that, well, there's a lot of people that will say renewables are the only way to go. They're most likely not realistically going to be able to support our energy grid now. So we're looking at having to try to reduce the amount of energy we use. And once again, as a kind of final disclaimer here, shaming people is not going to work. We cannot shame either side of this conversation. It would be productive. So if you're going to have conversations with people around these topics, try to be open-minded, but also don't buy into things you don't necessarily fully believe. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me for this half an hour. Be sure to stick around for the next few episodes of this energy series where I'm going to take a look at green energy and the military. And then uh, I'll have a surprise at the end of the month. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me, guys. I'll see you all next time.